Hello, everybody. I see a lot of familiar faces here, so thanks for showing up to uh, our work this morning, bright and early. Really appreciate it. Um, well, Mark said everything about humane letters that I was going to say. So as <laughs> as the students say, you know, as the students say when they raise their hand, oh, he said he already said everything I was going to say. So I have nothing to say now. Um, no. Uh, uh, well, I'll dovetail into a lot of that, but um, teaching humane letters just personally for me has been uh, one of the, outside of my family, probably the greatest joy of my life, uh, and I'm not uh, exaggerating. Um, I, they pay me here to grade essays, not to teach humane letters, because it is, um, it's such a joyful thing to do with the kids. And uh, the benefit of having worked at, at, with Great Hearts now for eight years is that you see uh, a sixth grader become an adult, become a college student. And uh, I feel, you know, I, I sort of feel bad for people who only teach at a middle school who get seventh and eighth graders all the time, and then they don't get to see, except for that rare student who comes back and really profusely apologizes, you know? <laughs> they, they don't get to see the, the growth. And the beautiful thing about being here is seeing an eighth grader who it, it can be the toughest time in their life. And you just think, oh man, I, I feel for you. I don't know if, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna make it through. And then they defend their senior thesis and you never would have known, you know? And they go off to that college interview and uh, they are the final product of what we're hoping to achieve here. And I mean, in a very human way. Uh, and so it's a really beautiful thing. So I've seen firsthand the transformative power of the education and of what we do in Humane Letters. And hopefully I can explain a little bit more about how that happens, how you get from uh, a 13-year-old who can barely dress themselves to uh, a senior who can barely dress themselves. So. Okay, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, uh, why, why Humane Letters? Um, as Dr. Disher said, it's one of the most important things we do at Great Hearts, um, and it's unique to a classical liberal arts education. And so I, I, I like to start with etymology. I think it's a lot of fun because we often say words that don't mean what they used to mean, or within it is contained the answer. You know, we work on that with the students. And, and humane is a really good one. So humane now usually means showing compassion or kindness, you know, being humane to, in your treatment of others or in, uh, to animals or something like that. And, and that is definitely a branch of what the word means. But in regards to learning, it's, it means to intend to have a civilizing or refining effect on people. So the, the etymology being, of course, originally Latin, and then bad Latin, or French, as we call it, <laughs> and then uh, Old English, which is, uh, which means basically to be a human meant having a quality befitting a human. So to be a human did not simply mean your biology is human. It means you act as though a human should act. And uh, the letters obviously refer referring to those things that we read and that have the quality of making us more human if we interact with them, if we make them a part of ourselves. So I think, I think a, a really good example of this is from Pico uh, della Mirandola, who is one of the leaders of the, the humanist movements um, in Renaissance Italy. And he basically says that on his oration on the dignity of man, that man is worthy of the highest admiration because he's granted the power to degrade himself into the lowest form of life or to become like the divine. He can be vegetative, sensitive, or intellectual. So 
He says, if you see a person totally subject to his appetites, crawling miserably on the ground, you're looking at a plant, not a man. Now the kids really like that. that you're a plant. <laughs> That's what, of course what sophomores say to each other now. That's what they got out of that. <clears throat> If you see a person blinded by empty illusions and images and made soft by their tender beguilements, completely subject to the senses, you're looking at an animal, not a man. If you see a philosopher judging things through his reason, admire and follow him. He is from heaven, not the earth. If you see a person living in deep contemplation, unaware of his body and dwelling in the inmost reaches of his mind, he's neither, neither from heaven nor earth, he is divinity clothed in flesh. So this idea that human beings have this very unique place in nature in that we don't necessarily act human just because we are human, that we have the freedom to degrade ourselves and to be enslaved by our senses rather than to act in a way that makes us human. And so that word humane refers to one who is civilized and refined in that they act as a human being should act. So humane letters, I think breaking it down that way helps us to understand that is the goal. That's the goal of humane letters. So you've heard it said, you are what you eat which is why a chicken stands before you today, right? <laughs> if we break these things down, they're kind of silly. We are not what we eat. We make what we eat us. We actually firmly believe that we are our thoughts, words, actions, and beliefs. And that it's these actions, these movements that guide one's soul and one soul which guides these movements in an either symbiotic or sort of parasitic relationship. And that many people live according to this sort of programming about what is good for them without ever actually examining it, without ever looking at how it got there, where it came from, and what it contains. And I, I believe that this is where Humane Letters comes in. It helps to free us from being plants or animals, a slave to our own passions or laziness or unexamined beliefs that we might have simply inherited. Rather, we're freed, which is the liberal of liberal arts that Dr. Disher was talking about, by knowing on an intellectual level what is good and how we ought to go about living life versus the way that we might want to go about living life sometimes. As a, as a father and a husband, there's definitely a way I want to live life that does not, that's not very convenient with raising good children or being good to my wife. So I think this is very practical. And the thing is, by the time a child is 14, I'm sure you are acutely aware at this point by having 13 and 14 year olds, they actually need to come to this knowledge freely. You can no longer force it into them. You probably haven't been able to for, for a while now. <laughs> right? And so if they're going to rebel in a way that is healthy, in a way that they are finding their own individuality, let's have it be toward what is good which is what you've been saying all along. But you know now it's not just coming from mom and dad. So they need to come to this knowledge freely. They need to absorb it into their bloodstream, developing their intellect and reason at this critical time when their mind is developing so that they can constantly seek that which is good throughout their lives. That is what we want for them. So to bring us back out of the philosophical for a moment and into the practical, Basically what we do is we put the greatest works of Western civilization in front of the student and we require that they reckon with it actively. And in a time when so much information is gathered by a person passively, when it's beamed in front of you. You know, I watch my son when we let him watch TV and it's like, 
<laughs> being beamed into him completely passively, right? When that is the way that so many people are learning, we, we require that they actively come to it in, in a way that society is not training them to do. So they must reckon with it, they must read it, they must discuss it, they must formulate a thesis and original ideas about it, and then they must argue it verbally and in writing. And we believe that this makes it a part of them. So another practical question, why would we combine history, philosophy, theology, literature all into one class? And why just the Western civilization? Don't we care about other cultures? I'll try and answer all of these. We ultimately do this to create citizens of the United States, first and foremost. And this is a really practical need and a really practical problem. So Thomas Jefferson understood once we wanted a democracy, that you better have an educated democracy. Because in a democracy, the citizenry holds the very fabric of society together. So we find ourselves in a conundrum when we are asked to elect people who can lead our societies better than we can. That's the conundrum of representative democracy. How do I know that someone can do it better than me if I don't know what it means to do it better than me. Who could we blame for them but ourselves? We find ourselves in quite a difficult situation when the day-to-day -day running of a society relies on us and we're taught not to think about or value what is good, what is lasting, or what is right, not for ourselves but for society or for the future generations of society. If we in America have a series of individuals who are building society to benefit ourselves, what about the next generation? What about the fabric that holds society together? So this problem and this challenge is really why we combine the disciplines, and so I'll try and explain that. Starting with history, if we understand the story of our past and we understand the heroic or tragic undertakings of those who came before us, then we can better see the purpose of living the political life. If we see what certain people stood for and what they accomplished, then maybe we can hopefully vote for those people, though they're always few and far between in every age. Hopefully we can see them when they come along. It allows us to examine the road we're walking on. So if we look at the story of civilization as the metaphor of building a road, sometimes a very winding road, and each generation moves the road forward, and by forward I mean in a given direction, so not necessarily the direction it was going, but they build it. They build a portion of it. If that generation of people and its leaders have no knowledge of the direction the road was heading, or how long it is, or what ideas had already gone into building that road or directing it in a certain direction, there's very little chance that they will build it well, or that it will continue to head where it ought to be going. On the other side of that analogy, if the builders spent a considerable amount of time surveying the land and looking at the extent of the road and studying how it had been built and why sometimes it swerved this way and that or took a new direction altogether, they might just be worthy of the task of building it. They might improve upon it or right some of the wrong turns. Examining history in the right way should not be just examining a series of facts and dates, but it should be allowing us to do this for our democratic society. And it allows us to see those individuals who stood against the wrongs of any age. And surprise, surprise, they were often liberally educated because they had a vision of the good and they said, wait, these, these myths? that you're saying are, are good? Something like slavery, right? 
in our country, something like uh, separation. This myth that everyone around you, that the whole society, the fabric of society in, in your place and time is saying, no, this is the way it ought to be. They can climb out of that because they have a vision of what is objectively good and they can write history. They can help to write the entirety of a society. We want nothing less than that for your children. We want to do that. We want your children to be able to be those people in whatever small ways in their society and community or whatever large ways. Fiction, I think, allows us to go even deeper into the study of what it means to be a human being and to live a humane life because we are forced to empathize with, with people, with characters, on a personal and intimate level. We can know a character in a book better than we can know some of our friends because of the insights that we are given into them. Philosophy, the love of wisdom, gives us deep insights into the nature of things and causes us to question what is good, to put our deeply held beliefs and prejudices to the test, and to temper them in the fire of reason. So when we speak of creating a citizen, we want to create someone who will carry the torch of what is fundamentally good about the Western tradition onward. And that means they must have a deep understanding of the Western tradition and what is good about it. So that's what we're doing. So I'll give you just a quick overview. Ninth grade. We start with the American tradition because it's what's most knowable. So if you're jumping into this fairly new thing, you've had some training in, in lit comp, but we start with, well, what can you see around you? And how did we get here? And where are we going? So American history, literature, philosophy. What does it truly mean to be an American? At the end, I'll give you um, a selection of the questions that our ninth and 10th graders have answered on essays, and that should help to, to elucidate that. 10th grade is modern Europe. What are the roots of modernity? Let's go back a little bit further. What are the assumptions of modernity? What are the features of modernity? And then 11th grade, the classical period, the Odyssey, the Iliad, the Platonic Dialogues, Aristotle, the Republic, which is the cornerstone of what we do in Humane Letters, Herodotus, Thucydides. Every renaissance that has happened in Western civilization, every single renaissance, there's not just that major one, happened throughout the medieval ages as well and beyond, has been linked to a recovery of the Greek classics, Aristotle or Plato. It is so powerful for civilization to read these books that it creates renaissances in our society. And we are hoping that one is on the horizon. Twelfth grade are basically the works throughout the ages that are of the highest level that we really could not teach before 12th grade. And so it is a smattering of all of it, <laughs> but that they're finally ready for as, as seniors. And by senior year, they are coming up with their own questions and they are running their own discussions. And the teacher sleeps in the corner and it's the <laughs> best job, you know. And, and the teacher is there to guide and keep them on track. Okay. And this all ends with a senior thesis that's a year-long process in which they get to team up with a faculty member and work with them all year one-on-one, -on -one, picking out books and discussing those books and taking those three books and turning them into one synthesis. Uh, that's a 12 to 14 page paper and then they defend that paper in front of a panel of three faculty one of which is their advisor, so they do have someone on their team in their corner, don't worry. It's not an experience that always ends in tears. It actually rarely does. It, it's incredible to see a student, the, the first half an hour, just bewildered, like, I, I forgot my entire paper, I can't say anything. <laughs> and then, and then they, they get it, and they, they go through this experience, and, and then they defend it, and the confidence that they have after that and going through that 
it's, uh, it's really beautiful. If anything, I'm crying at the end because <laughs> yeah, I remember that, that little 12 year old. So how do we do this? We do it through the Socratic method. We basically just use the miracle that is the intellect which can grasp knowledge, which can know something that is not of human invention, but that humans can know. So math, we did not invent math. Nature works according to math. We discover math, but we can know it and figure it out without someone telling us. And to me, that is a miracle, that our intellect can grasp a thing that it did not know before. Sure, with the assistance of someone, but not by them telling you. And that, to be able to do that, to hone that part of yourself as an adult, can create a huge divide in terms of what it means to be a human being. The difference between knowledge and information, according to Mortimer Adler, who helped to bring back the liberal arts, is information is something you read, and you readily understand. It's the internet, it's the newspaper, it's articles, it's all these things. But it's not knowledge, it's just more information, it's more of the same. Knowledge is looking at something and really not understanding it fully, and then through a process of guidance or puzzling over it, you get that aha moment and you finally do. That is the gaining of knowledge. And so when I talked with students about this, it's a really good analogy to something like lifting weights. If I'm lifting the same, num uh, same weight every day, I'm, great, I'm lifting the same weight every day. Uh, I'm not, because I'm a dad, so <laughs> I'm, I'm getting weaker constantly. <laughs> I guess I have human weights that I can, <laughs> maybe I'm onto something, okay. But if, if I can continue to push myself to do something I couldn't do yesterday, then I'm much stronger than I once was. And it's the same with the intellect. You passively receive, you, you don't get stronger. If anything, you get weaker. You actively search for, your intellect strengthens. And so we do it through examination. And so we believe that true learning can only take place with a spirit of in inquiry that is basically natural in children as you know, if you've gone through the why stage, where there is no end to the why, right? Where, well, but why this, mom? Well, because of this. Oh, okay, but why that? Well, because of this. Well, why that? And then you're questioning your whole life. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I didn't have humane letters, but I had you, so. <laughs> I don't know why I have to work and make money and can't be here with you, son. I'm sorry. I, I mean, I have practical answers, but okay. And so what we want to do, which sadly education often snuffs out today, is just keep that spirit alive that is already in the children and guard it into adulthood. And in, those, in that difficult age of adolescence, when popular opinion or your tyrannical opinion of yourself can snuff that out, we want to keep it alive. So we're really not necessarily instilling anything. I mean, we are, but we're just guarding something that is already very human. So we do this with this spirit of inquiry. So in ninth grade, I will pose a question about a text and then we'll answer it all together. And I'll try and guide them to the answer. We try to understand what the text is saying, and then we can argue whether or not it's reasonable. And I think this is such a practical skill. Hey, let's understand what someone's saying first before we argue with them. <laughs> so if that, I'm not going to promise that that's gonna change at home in the next couple of years. <laughs> but hopefully it will change with the things that they read. That instead of jumping to a, an opinion that they already hold, that they try to empathize with someone else's point of view. As Atticus Finch says, walk around in their shoes, see how it feels, what it's like, and then decide. 
through your reason, through the reason of the class, the mega mind of our class combined, whether or not what they're saying is good, or what about what they are saying is good. That's why we're not afraid to read the Communist Manifesto. And you might come to me in two years saying, You've, my child is a communist now. <laughs> but probably not, because hopefully they will see that Marx is arguing against an evil that is occurring that's dehumanizing people through the Industrial Revolution, but that maybe some of his solutions aren't great, and maybe some are good, and let's talk about that. And then you can know what communism is, rather than saying, oh, hey, here's communism, it's terrible. Ooh, it's terrible. Thank you, Mom and Dad, I'll go check that out. <laughs> And then empathizing with people who are that way. We read, uh, in sophomore year, when we talk about World War II, we read Mussolini's speeches, because a lot of them don't know who Mussolini is. You start, if you say Hitler, they automatically know and it's there. But you read Mussolini's speeches, and they are inspiring, and it's dangerous. But rather than saying, hey, here's who Mussolini was, he was a fascist, this entire country became fascist because Italians are apparently evil at that time, right? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Because of the things that he said, the way he inspired people, and they weren't able to take apart his argument and say, uh, these are a lot of nice words, your end seems very nice, but the means are really concerning to me. Those are the sorts of things we want to do in Humane Letters. So I'll wrap up by just giving you um, a sample of the questions that our 10th graders have been asked thus far to write about. Uh, at the end of ninth grade, their final exam is both a paper and a final discussion in which they have to answer the following, using all the texts from the year. What is the American ideal of freedom? What makes America unique? as a nation? What does it mean to be a hero in this country? Are Americans primarily idealistic, realistic, or an equal mix of both? In what characters that you examine this year do you see elements of idealism or realism? What three virtues do you believe Americans value most? What is the American dream? How do Americans primarily define success? Has this changed over time? Yes. If so, in what ways? Finally, based on all of the above research, what do you ultimately believe it means to be an American? Provide your own thesis. For essays, we talk, when we read Billy Budd, is the captain justified in executing Billy Budd? How does Billy's innocence lead to his death? Can a truly good person survive the evil and injustice in society? In Huck Finn, are Huck and Jim true friends? What is true friendship? Why does Huck ultimately leave society at the end of the novel? The life of Frederick Douglass. What are the ways in which slavery dehumanizes people, both slaves and slave owners? Othello, what compels Iago to commit his evil actions and who is ultimately responsible for Desdemona's death at the end of the play? For Thoreau, what is the purpose of government? Is Thoreau right to say that the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation? What's his solution? 10th grade, Henry V, is Henry a good king? What are the responsibilities of kingship? How does utopian society, for utopia, eliminate the root causes of, pol of ambition, political conflict, and everything like that? Does it really? How does utopian society seek to balance the needs of the individual and the needs of the community? They read John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and we ask them to compare their ideas about humans in the state of nature, natural law, the origin of society, the goal of society, proper grounds for revolution, what property is, and the sources of inequality in society. 
And then finally, we just read Frankenstein, and they had to answer, how should man properly view nature? And to what degree is Victor responsible for the events in the novel? And they will continue to do this throughout their experience here. They'll continue to ask these sorts of questions. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much.